morning, Saturn Road. Glad to be with you in our daily Bible study. Glad to be back with you, period. Uh, thanks to Jeff for filling in for me last week uh, while I was out a little bit uh, under the weather. Glad to be back. Listen to these words. I think you'll know them. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, those are from the Declaration of Independence. It's one of our favorite documents. Many of you maybe have been able to go to Washington, D.C. and see that document in person. I wonder how many other countries have that word, that language in there, that it's one of our founding thoughts, one of our founding principles is that we have the right to pursue happiness. We value our freedoms, we value our rights, and we value our happiness. Uh, all the, think about all the books in the self-help section at the library or is there bookstores anymore? Maybe at Barnes and Noble there's a self-help section about and they're all trying, these authors are trying to help you figure out a way to be happy and to live a fulfilled life. So here's the $24,000 question for us today. Are you happy? Are you one of those people that you could say that you live a happy life? The pursuit of happiness, I guess, is attainable. That's what the document, the founding document says. If we pursue it, we'll be able to find it. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be uh, studying this idea of pursuing happiness. And not maybe the way the world pursues it, and maybe not the way you're thinking about it right now. But we're going to go back to the original source document, not the Declaration of Independence, but even further than that. We're going to go back to the scriptures. We're going to go all the way back to Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Particularly over these next few weeks, we're going to be in Matthew 5, and as he starts off the this, this Sermon on the Mount. Listen to these words. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of their righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you and persecute persecute you falsely and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That's the way we're going to look at this idea of pursuing happiness. This whole teaching here in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is one of the most powerful sections of scripture. It's a powerful summary of what it means to be a Christ follower. Not only what we're to do, but more importantly, what we're supposed to become. What we're supposed to become, like our attitude and our thoughts, are as important and probably more important than our actions. In fact, Jesus says, if, our, if we get our heart right, if we get our attitude and our mind right, the actions will follow. You don't have to worry about doing the wrong thing if your heart is right. We all need to be constantly going back to these three chapters, Matthew 6, 7, five, six, and seven, and do a check of our attitude and our hearts. Someone asked Mark Twain one time if he found the Bible a hard book to understand, and this was Mark Twain's answer. He says, I'm not bothered much by the parts I don't understand, but the parts I understand bother me a great deal. <clears throat> I love that. My business partner for many years is Steve Leak, and he and I shared this love of scripture and love of the Lord together and Steve used to always say says I don't really have a lot of problem with those words in the Bible that are in black and he says but those red letters give me grief every time we're looking at the red letters uh, out of Matthew 5 6 and 7 we're going straight to the author himself and he starts off this series about this idea of being happy you think it's a coincidence that Jesus starts off this radical sermon with this idea of wanting to be happy? I think people have wanted that from the very beginning. Uh, people have pursued it in the wrong direction for a long time, but Jesus kind of gives us a formula here. For the longest time, people have always been looking for some kind of formula, some kind of method to help them be happy, and Jesus is going to give it to us here 
in Matthew 5, uh, not, not so much the way the world sees it. We'll, we'll unpack that as we go through the series. We don't use the word blessed very much anymore. If somebody sneezes or coughs around us these days, we might say, bless you. In COVID world, we might say, get away from me. I don't know. Uh, but we don't use the word blessed, blessed very much and, uh, unless we're trying to maybe kind of talk churchy sometimes. Sometimes if I'm writing a note to somebody, I'll say, God bless, meaning I want God to bless their lives. Um, but this word here in uh, the Greek is the word makarios. And this is the definition. This is what the word makarios means. It's a state of happiness above earthly suffering. It's a transcendent happiness of a life beyond care, labor, and even death. The word blessed, the word makarios here goes deeper than what we think of when we think about the term happy. And it even goes deeper than what we, how we use the word blessed these days. Uh, happiness depends on what happens to us, is the way somebody put it. Happiness depends on what happens to us. But this idea here is that there is something out there that Jesus is going to help us find. Some ability to rise above what happens to us in this life and still have a meaningful and full life. And isn't that what we all want? Uh, joy, listen to this quote from Charles Swindoll. Joy is a positive attitude we choose to express. It's a matter of attitude that stems from our confidence in God. The belief that he is at work, that he is in full control, and that he is in the midst of whatever has happened, is happening or will happen. Charles Wendell says that's the definition of joy, and I think that word joy may be the word we need to hang on here, or at least think of that when we think about this word blessed here in Matthew 5. That's transcendent attitude, this transcendent feeling this in the core of us that God has got this and God's in control. So maybe the world, the word we're going to look at here is joy. What happens to us in this life can be hard and cruel and unfair. More often than not, much of what happens to me in this life is out of my control. I don't know if you've lived long enough to know that or not, but it's the truth. The Bible says it rains on the just and on the unjust. Have you lived long enough to know that to be true? Look around your neighborhood. Look around your family. Look at this church family. I've received three or four texts this morning from members of this church who are wonderful, devoted Christ followers who are experiencing real trouble and heartache in their lives right now. And so Christ begins his powerful sermon with this teaching that there is a way to rise above the circumstances that happen to us in this life and, and, and still live in this life. Our joy, our happiness, our blessedness is not just for the life to come when we go to be with the Father, but in this life, Christ says, there's a way to have this life right here and now. The message indicates that we can have this transcendent life before we get to heaven. It would be wrong to think that this joy or this happiness is only an inward attitude. Later in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this. He says that our outward expressions of joy need to be put on display. They need to be put on stools and in, in, in can, as candles and lights in the dark world to display to those who don't know about this Christ, that don't know about this Jesus, so they will want to have what we have as well. So our joy, our happiness, this thing we're pursuing here in Matthew 5 is, is one of the chief ways that we're evangelistic in the world when we can really grab a hold of this and show this kind of transcendent happiness. Somebody said, joy is the surest sign of the presence of God. Joy is the surest sign of the presence of God. William Barclay, one of the great commentators on the scripture, said this, however hard the Christian way, it is both in the traveling and in the goal, the way of joy. A gloomy Christian is a contradiction in terms, and nothing in all religious history has done more harm to Christianity than its connection to black cloths and long faces. And so, tomorrow we're going to begin this series on the Beatitudes, what we call the Beatitudes. Jesus' formula for to have a, how to have a blessed life here and now, a life that transcends our circumstances. And we're going to begin all that with verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Give some thought and some prayer. Be reading in Matthew 5 and maybe wrestle with what you think it means to be poor in spirit. And we'll address that tomorrow in our lesson. God bless you today.